me share with you. It is an absolute privilege and an honor for me to be here with you, um, to be installed as your pastor. Um, pastoring is not a right, it's a privilege. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Not everybody gets this privilege. Um, and I take it seriously every single day of my life. And I want you to know that from this day forward, I'm going to take all of you to bed with me at night. And I'm going to wake up with you in my heart every morning. And I'm going to carry you around with me every single day till I'm no longer your pastor. Amen. Amen. Yeah. It's the only way I know to do it. I've been trained by some very, 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 very good pastors and men. Um, and I only know one way to do it. That's 100 miles an hour. <laughs> I'll never cheat you. Um, I won't serve you TV dinners on Sabbath. I believe in full course meals. Amen. With dessert. Amen. And seconds. All you can eat buffet on a Saturday morning. Is that all right? Amen, amen, amen. I'm delighted that these three awesome men are here who have served your city so well. I'm looking forward to um, doing the days and weeks to come. I know you, you're on the clock. You've got four months until you're, 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 you're kicking your feet up, um, watching ESPN all day, but, you know, I'll, I'll get over to see you. Um, because I want you to know, and I want the city to know that, that we're servants. I'm here to serve. And I'll need, I'll need you to help me know and understand how we can better serve this community. Amen. Because that's what, that's what I want us to do. Amen? No church should be an island unto itself. That's, that's not church. Okay? Um, before, before I get started, I have some... I have some awesome friends that who are here with me. They're not going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you. You know, I had to, I had to pay them to be my friend. And, you know, I had to pay them to come here today. Boy, these are just horrible people. But anyhow, they're here. They, they follow me all around. So I want to introduce these individuals. Stand up, uh, not all the folk. My friends, stand up. Please stand up. Of course, of course, you know I'm kidding. Of course, you know I'm kidding, right? sense of humor. <laughs> but I have a word, I have a word for you today. I have a word, I have a word to you today. Uh, messages entitled Tell the World. I thought it was, I had a unique experience. I want to share that experience with you and I, I thought it was appropriate that I share with you this message because it absolutely, positively, categorically, without hesitation or equivocation. It's, it bespeaks who I am and what I've been called to do. Other than doing what I'm about to share with you, I have no other purpose for being on this planet. So here it is in a nutshell. You want to know who Frank Leggett is? This is it right here. Okay? Tell the world. Uh, by, by his with me. Father God, I thank you for bringing us to this moment. But this is not my moment. It's your moment. Because this is not my church, it's your church. These, these are not my people, it's your people. This is not my day, it's your day. So I ask, dear Lord, that you would do what you do best for your people. Yes. Bless them, guide them, instruct them, educate them, inform them. Open up their eyes that they might see where we are in the course of history. May they clearly understand their calling and mission in this church. In Jesus' name, we ask it for his sake. We pray. Let the church say. Amen. It was Sunday, September 4th, a year ago, 2011. It was approximately 6 a.m. that morning. I dreamt that I was in a store of some kind. And while I was in the store shopping, I don't know what I was looking for. But as I was in the store, suddenly the earth began to reel to and fro like a drunkard. Those, those who 
Court in the store with me, ran outside to see what the what the commotion was. But and people were screaming and hollering, and they were they were running for shelter. Uh, commotion and confusion and chaos was everywhere. I, on the other hand, remained calm because I knew what it was. It was an earthquake. I knew that. When the ground begins to rumble and shake, it's an earthquake. As I looked around, I saw that I'm outside now, and I'm, I'm looking around, and I can see in the distance, I can see a, a community all around, and I can see the tops of the buildings. They are there one second. Uh, but in the next second, those buildings crumble and disappear. The ground opens, and a whole community, a whole neighborhood, houses just disappear into nothingness. I watched in horror as these blocks and streets with houses and inhabitants fall into a deep hole and vanish. In seconds, ladies and gentlemen, it was over because I awakened from the dream. I was shaking like a leaf. It was as if I had just experienced it in real time, in real life. I lay in bed for a few minutes. I tried to gather myself. But there was, there was one overwhelming thing on my mind. It was in the form of three words. The three words were, tell the world. Was the message that was indelibly essence to my consciousness. Immediately I sensed that I was to tell the world what, what I had just experienced in the form of this dream. And it was as if I had been commissioned by the Almighty to instruct mankind as to the destruction that is to hit the earth in the immediate future. Yeah. I got up, I got in the shower, and, I, and, 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 and while I'm in the shower, I'm trying to shake this thing off. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get past this. But I could still see the buildings disappear into nothingness. I kept hearing as it were the voice of God, although there was no audible voice compelling me, commissioning me to tell the world. At approximately 6.21 a.m., I awakened my wife. Now, I need to pause for a minute. I need to pause for a minute. I need to pause for a minute. Because every one of you needs to understand that you don't wake Angela to get up at 6.21 in the morning. If she doesn't, if she's not going to work, you don't wake her up at 7.21 in the morning. You may be in trouble at 8.21 in the morning because my wife likes to sleep. So it was 6.21 in the morning. I shake her. Baby, you got to get up. Baby, you got to get up. She said, she said two words. Frank, no! her to get up because I had something I needed to share with her. After my protest, she acquiesced and I shared my experience. She was on one side of the bed and I was on the other side of the bed. And across the bed, we clasped hands and we prayed. And in the midst of my prayer, in the midst of that prayer, as I began to pray, there was one thing on my mind. I thought about my four children. I thought about my seven grandchildren. And there was one thing that was on my mind more than anything else at that point. And I said in my prayer over and over and over and over and over and over again until the tears began to flow. And I began to, I began, I began to sob and cry like a two-year-old. I began to say, we are not as I thought about my children, as I thought about my one child who was outside of the household of faith, who's been raised in this church, church school all her life, never in public school. She's outside of the household of faith. I begin to say, we are not ready. 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 Having had this experience, I now understand what Nebuchadnezzar must have felt. The morning after his dream, he was compelled to ascertain his meaning. It is my stated intention to comply and tell the world of my experience. If what I saw in a dream is to become a reality in the not too distant future, 
then the entire world must be warned of the destruction that is imminent. But I first, but I, but first I question why me since I am not a prophet. Is the practice of nonprofits receiving dreams concerning last day events biblical? I asked. I asked the Lord. I had to find out. We called a friend and informed her, and she referred me to this text that I am about to read. Here it is. Acts 2.17 says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. When I get to heaven, I'm going to I'm gonna have to talk to the Lord, because I, I, I you know, I'm not an old man. I, you know, I got, I'm, I'm going to have to talk to the Lord. I got some issues with that when I'm telling you. But there was my confirmation. But I have one more question. The scripture and the spirit of prophecy harmonized with the destruction, the devastation, and loss of life that I saw in my dream. Let's find out. In Matthew 24, the master reveals signs that point to his second coming. In response, scripture says this, Matthew 24, 3, but disciples come to him. The disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? What are the signs? How are we going to know? Go ahead. Go ahead. Come on, man. Yes. Go ahead. It's a question they ask. Yes. yes. The master responds by sharing and elaborating on the signs and the warnings that point forward to the imminence or the nearness of Christ's soon return, which is the focus of my message today. Yes. I want to focus your attention on the signs and warnings in verse 7, Matthew 24, 7. For nation shall rise against nation, yes. kingdom against kingdom. Yes. There shall be famines, yes. pestilences, yes. earthquakes yes. in diverse places. Amen. What is the master telling us here? Yes. Here's what he's telling us. Point number one. Destruction and devastation in the last days will serve to warn mankind of the nearness of Christ's return. I repeat. Destruction and devastation in the last days will serve to warn mankind of the nearness of Christ's return. Amen. I want you to listen to this the counsel from, from my favorite author. She says this. Country Living, page 7, paragraph 4. She says, I am bidden to declare the message that cities full of transgression and sinful in the extreme will be destroyed by earthquakes, by fire, by flood. Jesus. All the world will be what? All the world will be warned. will be warned. Yeah. And he's got to warn you. Yes. Because if he didn't, if he did not, if he would do the secret rapture thing, which is not biblical, yeah. and he would sneak up on you, you could argue, Lord, if I, if, if I just had, if I, if I knew you were coming, I'd be ready. Amen. God's not going to let you have that argument. I'm not going to let you have that argument. Amen. All the world will be warned that there is a God who will display his authority as God. Amen. His unseen agencies will cause destruction, devastation, and death. All the accumulated riches will be as nothingness. Amen. And if you're asking, and if you're asking, why must God go to such extreme measures to warn mankind in the last days? Why? Why does he go to that length? Here's why. Matthew 24, 37, 38, 39. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. 38. 
meat. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage into the day that Noah entered into the ark. 39. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. I dare to say, I dare to say to you, that if lions, tigers, and bears, and all kinds of ravenous beasts come out of the woods and, and, and line up in single file and go into this huge boat or ship or whatever, and you see it and it doesn't suggest to you that you need to get on there too, something's wrong with you.
to be lost and outside the ark of safety. It makes no sense. You know how the story is going to end. Yes. Here's what the servant of the Lord says. She said, while at Loma Linda, California, April 16, 1906, there passed before me a most wonderful representation during a vision of the night. I stood on an eminence from which I could see houses shaking like a reed in the wind. Buildings, great and small, falling to the ground. Pleasure resorts, theaters, hotels. Can you say Atlantic City? <laughs> and the homes were shaken and shattered. Many lives were blotted out of existence. And the air was filled with the shrieks of the injured and the terrified. Continue to describe the vision, Ellen White declares. The angel that stood by my side declared that God's supreme rulership and the sacredness of his law must be revealed to those who persistently refuse to render obedience to the king of kings. Those who choose to remain disloyal must be visited in mercy with judgments in order that if possible. They may be aroused to a realization of the sinfulness of their course. The Lord knows that when trouble comes, the people of God learn righteousness, Isaiah 26. Therefore, he pulls back his protective agencies and permits the warning judgment to befall mankind in an effort to save those who are savable. That's why the servant of the Lord says this. While appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, he will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Even now he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea, by land, and in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes, terrific hailstorms, tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes, in every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. God doesn't do this kind of stuff. Y'all didn't know that. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. God does not bring these devastations. God steps back and he permits. Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the right winning harvest and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint and thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations, conclude, these visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon, will be upon both man and beast. Amen. Country living. She says, I am bidden to declare the message that cities full of transgression and sinful in the extreme will be destroyed by earthquake, by fire, by flood. All the world will be warned. I, this is the second time I did this, isn't it? Amen. Anyway, you need to hear it again. <laughs> All the world will be warned. <laughs> so, is there any evidence that these kinds of catastrophic Devastating, destructive events are taking place right now. Is there any evidence? Show me that. Okay. January, January 2010. Haiti. Yes, yes, yes. Imagine morning time. Yes. All of a sudden, the ground begins to rumble. Yes. Next thing you know, either you or someone you love is near and dear to you is buried under a house. Let me say this to some of you. Some of y'all can't afford to die. I'm going to say it again. Some of you can't afford to die. Because if you did, the life that you're living, some of you can't get in a tragic, life-threatening car accident. Some of you can't be caught in a drive-by.
Next slide. Next year. Next year. August 2011. It was an earthquake in Richmond, Virginia. We don't get earthquakes in Richmond, Virginia. Or the East Coast. We do now. Sri Lanka, December 25, 2004. Folk are in Sri Lanka on vacation. Here's my question. Here's my question. Here's my question. You're not ready for the coming of the Lord. And the ocean is running at you. How quickly can you get right with God? And do you even want to live in this condition? Now they're running. How many of you get out of the ocean? Put your hand down. Put your hand down. Put your hand down. She says, this 
may be a duplicate. I, I got this may be a duplicate. If it is, I apologize. But she says, calamities will come. Next. Calamities will come. Um, calamities most awful, most unexpected. And these destructions will follow one after another. If there will be a heeding of the warnings that God has given, and if the churches will come together and repent. Returning to their allegiance, then other cities may be spared for a time. It won't stop it all together, but it can delay the process so that more people can be warned. Of course, what are we doing since Sandy? What are we doing to warn people? That this is what we just experienced? What we just experienced? It was a category one that was downgraded. I'm telling you, stuff that's coming down the road is going to make Sandy look like a picnic. Yes. Yes. Question is, are you ready? Because if you're not ready, you can't help anybody else get ready. If you're not ready. Continue in the same way in which they have been walking, disregarding the law of God and presenting falsehood before the people. God allows them to suffer calamity that their senses may be awakened. That their senses may be awakened. Amen. I'm almost done. I want you to listen to this. I don't like had a vision where she saw huge balls of fire coming down from the sky causing destruction, much destruction. She says the saints of God that, that cry out. She says, here's what they cried out. Let me give you the scenario. There are individuals, there are Adventists who, and there's some neighbors living nearby because of all the destruction that's going on. That they are apparently together uh, and, and, and and the, the, the saints of God cry out, the Lord has come, the Lord has come. Many were unprepared to meet him, but a few were saying, praise the Lord. Yeah. Here are their neighbors, here are their neighbors, their friends, their family members who are outside the ark of safety. They said, why are you praising the Lord? And cry those upon whom was coming sudden destruction. And he, here's, what the, here's what the saints of God said, because we now see what we have been looking for ever since we joined this church. Yeah. Those who were lost declared, if you believe these things were coming, why did you not tell us? We've lived next door to you for years. In some cases, decades. We raised our children together. We went through the same grade school and elementary school and high school. And how did you not tell us?
Would you be ready? Would you be saved? No. If not, if the answer to that question is no, then my follow-up question is, what are you going to do about it? If the answer to the first question is no, the follow-up question is, then what are you going to do about that? Because it disturbs me, everybody that I ask the question to, and they say no. That's what it is. It can't end there if you want to go to heaven. And so, my final appeal is this. If the general conference session took place in Norristown, Pennsylvania, and every family member, every person that you knew was in this large convention hotel, and somehow you got wind that there is, that there is going to be, that a terrorist plot is about to be launched and a bomb is about to be exploded in the building. And everybody that you know, if they're not warned, is going to die. So you rush to the hotel and lo and behold, the communication system in the hotel is knocked out. Go ahead. Go ahead. So you can't you can't have anybody get on the phones. The the wireless, the Wi-Fi knocked out. You can't even call them on your cell phones. Go ahead. All right, man. Yes. But everybody you know in less than an hour is gonna die. Go ahead. Go ahead now. So that means you got one thing to do. Yes. What you gonna do? Right. No, 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 no. And sometimes you know, no. Some things require more than prayer, y'all. Sometimes you need to go beyond prayer. You need to go floor by floor, room by room. Get out! Get out! Get out! Destruction's coming. Get out now! Destruction's coming. Door by door. Amen. That's where we are. Amen. You know destruction is coming. Yes. This past week, it's just a foretaste. You've got members of your own family who are outside the ark. Amen. What you going to do? Amen. You've got a whole town of folk, of residents, who are not prepared. Amen. What you going to do? Amen. Amen. You must warn them. Yes. Lord is coming soon. Hear the signs. Hear the signs. At some point, I'm going to preach another sermon. Yes. It could have, it, it could, it could, no, no, that's not the one. Um, whatever it is, I'm going to share with you. Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. That's it. it could happen tomorrow. It could happen tomorrow. I'm going to share with you, starting in 2004, I'm going to demonstrate to you the intensity, the intensity of all of these disasters. It's going to blow your mind. He said in your message. The only question is, does the saints of God see the warnings? And two, what are you going to do about it? Or are you just comfortable being a member? Are you comfortable? Is your heaven, is your heaven coming to church every Sabbath? If, if that's what your heaven is, you better enjoy this. Because it's going to be the only one you're going to experience. But if heaven is greater than this, as a church family, we got work to do. Amen. We got work to do. Amen. And so if you're ready for the challenge, if you're ready for the challenge, because see, I've been placed on earth to do one thing and one thing only. Prepare people for the coming of the Lord. Amen. That's my only purpose for living. If I'm not fulfilling that purpose, I have no reason for existing. Because that's what he called me here to do. Yes. And I didn't always understand that. I get it now. Yes. Go ahead. I get it. Go ahead. I get it. I got it. My first job is to prepare you for the coming of the Lord. Yes. And then to prepare everybody around us. Yes. Go ahead. Amen. So you're ready for the challenge. Amen. You're ready for the challenge. Yes. 
I challenge you. Come forward. Because you're dedicating yourself to do something you've never done before. And if you're not ready for the challenge, we need to go back to the executive committee and tell the executive committee you sent the wrong guy. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm serious. Because I don't waste time. When I was serving the devil, I was smoking it, I was drinking it as fast as I could. Because I was a I was all the way live. I don't know how to do it any other way, really. So when I was serving the other guy, I was giving him everything I had. And now I'm serving my Lord and Savior. So if this is just about playing church, I'm the wrong guy. But if this is about getting ready and preparing everybody else to be ready, if you're ready for that challenge, I invite you to come forward and we need to pray and dedicate ourselves to that task, that mission. Because there is no other mission. That's the mission. Young, younger and older. That's the mission. Everything else is a distant second. Here we are, Lord. We stand to dedicate and commit ourselves anew. Lord, we acknowledge that we are not where we ought to be. But we know that you can help us to get there. No ifs, no ands, no buts. So Lord, the people that you've given me to shepherd as their under-shepherd, I present to you the ultimate shepherd, the great shepherd. Yes. Get us ready. Get us ready. Get us ready. Right here, right now. No foolishness. No dumb stuff. No distractions. It's too late in the game. And send those who need to be here. As we go before the city, open the doors that need to be opened that we might be received with thanksgiving. We're not, we're not fanatics. We're just students of the word. Believers of the word. Help us to impact others. And when you come, it is my prayer. <coughs> that this congregation would be five times, ten times, a hundred times larger than this. Because we've embraced the mission and the calling that you've placed on Grace Tabernacle, Seventh-day Adventist Church. So that you, our Lord and Savior, can be glorified. In Jesus' name we ask it. For his sake we pray. Let the church say, Amen. 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 Hug somebody. Hug somebody. Give some, give some love.